Hi, it's Patrick Hutzel again from IntensiveCareHotline.com with the second part of the video The 10 things you didn't know are happening behind the scenes in intensive care that hold you back from having control, power and influence and peace of mind whilst your loved one is critically ill in intensive care. So we're now coming to point number 6. End of life decisions are often hastened by the intensive care team because of bed pressures financial viability and or budget pressures and sometimes because of medical research interests. End-of-life situations in intensive care are a privilege if handled correctly with compassion and with you, your family and your critically ill loved one being at the center of the care delivered. Those situations can add tremendous value to the family who is losing a loved one. Those situations can also add tremendous value to the intensive care team if they are open to make an end of life decision end of life situations memorable positive and compassionate some intensive care units are good at delivering outstanding end of life care and others are average some intensive care units are shocking when it comes to delivering end of life care those units usually pay no or very little attention to a family's wishes and their needs in an end-of-life situation where they are faced with the challenge of losing a loved family member. If you think about it for a minute, it's a massive, tragic and dramatic event in the life of a family who is about to lose a loved one to critical illness. Often this massive challenge comes out of nowhere where days or weeks before their loved one has been admitted to intensive care have gone by without families even anticipating that such a drama could unfold soon. On the one hand, end-of-life situations can be extremely challenging, frustrating, difficult and heartbreaking. And once again, they can be very satisfying, they can be a privilege and they can put people at ease even. On the other hand, many intensive care units because they have so many competing interests, they have so many moving parts behind the scenes that are hidden away from families of critically ill patients that intensive care units hasten end-of-life situations and they all but look at your, your families and your critically ill loved ones needs and wishes in such a challenging and difficult situation. After all, life is sacred and life is extremely precious. We must never take life for granted and we must never assume that we are invincible. The reality is that we are all going in the same direction, one way or another. In more than 15 years of intensive care nursing in three different countries, I have seen many poorly handled end-of-life situations where the needs and wishes of families of critically ill patients have not been taken into consideration and the death of their loved one has just been hasted just simply because the intensive care team had an interest in freeing up the intensive care bed, bed as quickly as possible to get the next patient in or they were trying to save money and expenses on the care of a dying patient. They were trying and freeing up staff, doctors and nurses mainly, in order to have them available to look after other patients. Or they were trying to stay away from getting too emotionally involved in an end-of-life situation. Or they were simply trying to exercise their authority and power. And sometimes they were even making families look stupid in the process. After all, the intensive care team always thinks they know what's best. That has certainly always been frustrating, challenging and dissatisfying when dealing with such situations, especially since I'm having an awareness that those situations could have been handled much, much better. For example, I have looked after some intensive care patients in their own home at the end of their life, so for me, those situations that have been handled poorly in a clinical environment and without foresight have always been a personal challenge to me as well. However, what's even been more frustrating in those situations is that families who were about to lose their critically ill family member had no idea what to do. They had no idea how to position themselves. They had no idea what to ask for because they simply didn't have the tools available that enabled them to have 
peace of mind, control, power and influence. So the things you and your <coughs> family can and should ask for in an end of life situations are things like comfort for you, for your family and for your critically ill loved one. However, this comfort looks like for you simply ask for it and don't be afraid to ask for things that you feel are non-negotiable for you, such as having more time with your critically ill loved one because you want certain people to be here, you want you want certain people to be here, you want certain rituals and you want certain religious and cultural needs met, etc. You also want to make sure that you, your family and your critically ill loved one have privacy and dignity in an end of life situation. I have seen many unfortunate end of life situations in intensive care where I, where I have seen and looked after patients who approach their end of life in intensive care over sometimes many months and many weeks in an open cubicle where they and their family had been exposed to a busy and noisy 24-7 intensive care environment with no nat natural daylight and with no shelter. Also, make sure that you and your family know, understand and also support the intensive care team's conclusion why your critically ill loved one is dying. Once again, depending on what's happening behind the scenes, the intensive care team might suggest to you and your family that death is the only option, whereas the hidden agenda of the intensive care team is to let your loved one die. Because they need the bed, they don't see your critically ill loved one as a viable and profitable case, and or the intensive care team doesn't want to continue treatment because they can't do medical research on your critically ill loved one. It's absolutely critical that you have done your own independent research. Last but not least, if your critically ill loved one is approaching the end of life in intensive care, have you and your family thought about taking your loved one home to approach the end of life in their own home? I have seen many families in intensive care over the last 15 years who asked to take their loved one home to have them pass away at home. Some surveys in Western countries have revealed that 75% of people want to die at home if given a choice, yet only 20% do so. That's a big shame and it's appalling that health services don't pay enough attention to the wishes of the people. Most families that I have worked with over the years in intensive care in an end-of-life situation have been bitterly disappointed by the health system because their wishes to have their loved one die at home remained unfulfilled and they often left with a bitter taste in their mouth. There is, however, light at the end of the tunnel. As I have mentioned earlier, I have personally looked after dying intensive care patients at home and it's one of the most satisfying end-of-life situations for patients, their families and also for health professionals. Thankfully, there are now intensive home care services emerging in countries like Australia, Germany, Austria and Switzerland. For more information, visit intensivecareathome.com.au Also, home care in end-of-life situations, even for intensive care patients, is possible, irrespective of what the intensive care team is telling you. Remember, their agenda and interests often don't match your agenda and interests. Let's move on to number seven. Not for resuscitation or do not resuscitate orders are being issued without your consent. This one is massive and it's often well hidden from families of critically ill patients. And when I first found out about it, I was absolutely shocked that this could happen in any intensive care unit, let alone in Western societies in first world countries. Basically, what it means is that if the intensive care team thinks or perceives that your critically ill loved one is not quote-unquote worthy of resuscitation in case of an emergency, they will document that in the medical notes. They will do so even though it violates basic human rights 
it often violates hospital policies, it also violates some of the staff's own values and beliefs, and it certainly violates your beliefs and values. It's just plain wrong and it's often illegal, breaching the law. It's happening all across the board in intensive care units. And again, there are some intensive care units that are open and transparent and get patients and families involved in the decision-making process. Is violating hospital policies and it's, as I said, it is happening all across the board in intensive care units and those intensive care units that are open and transparent and get patients and families involved in the decision-making process and then there are many other intensive care units who don't give a damn. In the intensive care units where the intensive care team documents not for resuscitation or do not resuscitate without your or your critically ill loved one's consent once again, the intensive care team is violating basic human rights, they are violating hospital policies and your and your family's job is to have an awareness that it could happen. The unfortunate reality is that I have seen and questioned many of those situations and whenever I've seen it and questioned it, often the response was that a certain senior doctor wants it that way or that it's quote unquote in the best interest of the patient and the family or that the patient wouldn't have any quality of life anyway or even worse the intensive care team condescendingly assumed that the patient or the family don't understand by that the intensive care team thinks that they are superior to you to your family and your critically ill loved one and that you and your family don't understand what's happening in intensive care. Thank God you've come to the right place here. Now, if you have read my Instant Impact report, you would have seen me talking about quality of life. It makes me very angry and frustrated that some doctors and nurses think that they can make judgments about what's in the best interest of your critically ill loved one. It also makes me frustrated and angry that anyone can have opinions about other people's perceived quality of life. The bottom line, the reality and the fact of the matter is that whenever the intensive care team is issuing a not for resuscitation or do not resuscitate order, it's serving their agenda and not yours. The intensive care team always has their bottom line in the back of their mind and not your or your critically ill loved one's well-being. They will tell you, of course, when you ask them that it's quote-unquote in the best interest of your critically ill loved one. Has anybody asked you and or your critically ill loved one what you think is in the best interest for them? If they haven't, they certainly should. And as I have mentioned many times before, if you don't assert yourself, the intensive care team will be walking all over you and your family because they are used to families being intimidated by their perceived power and that's why they often get away with issuing not for resuscitation and do not resuscitate orders without consent and it's illegal. It's a bit like signing an execution order without telling anyone. Your job is to question, ask the intensive care team for all the documents and your job is to also make clear that you have done your own research and that you know and understand what's at stake here. You see, for the intensive care team, having issued a not for resuscitation or do not resuscitate order is like a shortcut to emptying intensive care beds. They can then say that they can send patients with a with a not for resuscitation or do not resuscitate order to the ward and free up their ICU beds. It all happens by selling to you and your family what's in the best interest of your critically ill loved one or it happens by not telling you at all. And it will only get worse. An aging population will put more and more pressure on intensive care beds and the only option 
of managing resources and the intensive care beds is by making vulnerable patients not for resuscitation and or do not resuscitate. The grim reality is that patients and families in intensive care often don't know what the not for resuscitation or do not resuscitate order has been issued illegally without consent and it will just be mentioned when the doctors and the nurses hand over to each other and they hardly take notice of it because that's how wrongfully ingrained this practice is in the culture of some intensive care units. Let's move on to point number eight. And this point is, even if you and your family are under the impression that your critically ill loved one is for full treatment and if you and your family have been told that the intensive care team is going full steam ahead when treating your critically ill loved one, the intensive care team might view your critically ill loved one's case as a hopeless case, or as a difficult case, or as a medical research case, and the intensive care team therefore decides behind closed doors and, dis and without discussing with you and your family that if your critically ill loved one deteriorates or if their heart would stop that the intensive care team wouldn't rush things, which in the intensive care language or jargon means that they will let your critically ill loved one die should they deteriorate. On the other hand, if the intensive care team sees the opportunity to do some medical research, they might continue treating your loved one, giving you false hope and unnecessarily prolonging the suffering of your critically ill loved one. As a rule of thumb, always keep in mind that it's never what people say and it's always what they do. Intensive care is a strange place. Many good things happen in intensive care and many bad things happen as well. When things are good, they are great. And when things are bad in intensive care, you always, always need to question. You and your family need to be very vigilant observers of the intensive care team, because if you aren't, chances are that the intensive care team will drive their agenda forward without you even knowing that there is an agenda. Like in number seven, where we've looked at not for resuscitation and do not resuscitate orders, the intensive care team has often already made up their mind and they will twist and turn your critically ill loved one's case to their liking and according to their agenda. What do I mean by that? By that I mean that the intensive care team will present your critically ill loved one's case to their liking and according to their agenda. It also means that, as I have mentioned before, the intensive care team will often make up their mind behind closed doors in how they present your critically ill loved one's case to you and to your family. The intensive care team can often be very vague about outcomes as they often want to protect their professional reputation by not giving you any false hope in case things don't go well so that they can say we weren't quite sure in the first place. What I have also seen over and over again is that the intensive care team often pretends that everything is done and that your loved one is getting the best treatment there is only to find out that they are withholding certain drugs or withholding certain equipment that could potentially save your critically ill loved one's life. For example, your critically ill loved one might be in lung failure or ARDS and they might be commenced on high frequency oscillation ventilation. However, the best treatment nowadays is probably ECMO, which is acting as a bypass to the lungs. And that's probably also more expensive. The bottom line is that if you don't question, you, your family and your critically ill loved one are in a situation where you are at the mercy of the intensive care team and you certainly don't want to be in such a situation. If the intensive care team is doing that, they are deliberately withholding information from you and from your family, let alone from your critically ill loved one. That's why it's so important that you and your family know what questions you need to ask. That's why it's so important that you are watching the intensive care team very closely and that's why it's so important that you question 
everything. Another example would be if your critically ill loved one has been admitted to intensive care with a severe heart attack or if your critically ill loved one had a cardiac arrest which is when the heart stops and needs resuscitation. Your loved one may be very unstable and they may need inotropes to sustain the blood pressure and the contractility of the heart. They also may need antiarrhythmic drugs to get the heart back into a normal rhythm. They may also need an intraortic balloon pump which is a pump that improves blood flow and oxygenation to the heart or they may even need ECMO which is a total temporary bypass of the heart. However, the intensive care team also knows that the damage done to the heart after cardiac arrest or a heart attack is quite significant and that if they commence aggressive treatment such as inotropes, antiarrhythmic drugs and or the balloon pump or even ECMO that they may well rescue and save your critically ill loved one's life. However, they also know that it might be a lengthy process, that it might take time and that it might take a fair amount of expensive resources to get your loved one out of intensive care alive. The intensive care team also knows that now it's winter time and that the number of patients needing an intensive care bed for similar situations is at its peak. They therefore think twice before they go full steam ahead, so to speak, because they know that there are other patients waiting for similar treatment. The intensive care team also knows that if the therapy is successful, that the next steps may, w may well be to bridge your critically ill loved one to a cardiac assist device that's taking over the function of the heart at least for a while. Once again, that could be very expensive is using up an expensive intensive care bed and is time consuming and the intensive care team may weigh up their options not only depending on the demand they anticipate will happen in the next few weeks or so but they also weigh up other cases in the unit that may well use up a lot of expensive resources as well. At the end of the day the intensive care team has constraints whether they are mindset constraints or whether they are resource constraints. Having an awareness of what is happening is so important because if you don't then you are helpless without peace of mind, without power, without control and without influence. On the other hand if your critically ill loved one is in a situation where they had a severe heart attack and or a cardiac arrest and the situation is really dire and life-threatening where your loved one is inevitably going to die. The intensive care team in some instances may have an interest in maximizing and continuing treatment where your loved one and unnecessarily prolonging the suffering of your critically ill loved one. The intensive care team may do so if they have an interest in keeping the bed occupied for longer as they may currently have little demand on beds and or your critically ill loved one may be a good case where the intensive care team can continue to do some medical research. Then in these situations the intensive care team will present your critically ill loved one's case in a light where they may give you false hope so that they can continue treatment and usually in those situations your critically ill loved one is suffering and unnecessarily prolonging the suffering. That's what I mean when I say that the intensive care team may twist and turn your critically ill loved one's case to their liking and according to their needs and according to their agenda. Let's move on to number nine. The intensive care team's positioning of your critically ill loved one's prognosis and diagnosis is always dependent on whether your critically ill loved one is viewed as a good business case or a bad business case. Yes, despite all the medical advancement in recent decades and despite the sometimes heroic things that can happen in intensive care, most intensive care units are either there to make money or at least to adhere to an annual budget. Therefore, the intensive care team will use resources such as staff, equipment such as beds, ventilators, etc. as a means to an end. Meaning that the first thing is to look at the patients in the beds 
not only from a clinical perspective, they also view them as business cases. This is especially important for you to know because, let's say, your 78-year-old mother has been admitted to intensive care with a heart attack that resulted in a cardiac arrest with cardiopulmonary resuscitation and your 78-year-old mother is now ventilated in an induced coma. Your 78-year-old mother has previously been fit and healthy and she lived an independent life. The intensive care team is painting a pretty grim doom and gloom picture of the situation and they mention from the very first time you have met them that a withdrawal of treatment and or limitation of treatment might be quote unquote in the best interest of your critically ill mother. The intensive care team hasn't mentioned that an intraortic balloon pump or ECMO or a left ventricular assist device might save your mother's life and what the intensive care team also hasn't mentioned is the fact that in another section of the intensive care units, unit they have two young patients in intensive care after a car crash and both patients have been occupying those beds for more than two weeks by now because they have both had severe head injuries and multiple other fractures. Especially with severe head injuries they can often take up time and resources and they can be very expensive to treat with very uncertain outcomes. Even in those cases where two very young patients were battling for their lives, the intensive care team did suggest to the families of those patients to think about a withdrawal of treatment or a limitation of treatment as quote unquote in the best interest for their critically ill loved ones. Again, just like with your mother, the intensive care team could foresee that those young patients would be staying in, in intensive care for a potentially very long time using up expensive resources that could potentially be used for other more financially viable patients. A financially viable patient, by the way, is usually a patient who's not staying in intensive care for very long, usually up to 72 hours. Getting back to our critically ill patients, including your mother, thankfully the families of the two young patients with head injuries and multiple fractures didn't even consider or contemplate that a withdrawal of treatment or a limitation of treatment was an option for their loved ones. They also knew that the intensive care team has other interests that go way beyond the prognosis and diagnosis of a critically ill patient. Those families educated themselves just like you do and they knew the right questions to ask and they also knew how to be difficult and demanding so that the families had peace of mind, control, power and influence. The same applies to you and your situation. You need to start talking to the intensive care team about your wishes, your desires and your goals for your critically ill loved one, irrespective of what the intensive care team is telling you. It's critically important that you are going to become difficult and demanding because if you are not the intensive care team will have the upper hand and once again they will twist and turn your critically ill loved ones case to their liking and according to their agenda. Never, never take no for an answer because if you don't you will find out the truth and you will find out whether the intensive care team has anything to hide or not. Let's move on to our last point, point number 10. Many intensive care units are heavily involved in medical research activities and generally speaking a lot of money and funding, five, six or even seven figure dollar funding is going towards research activities. Therefore, if your critically ill loved one falls into one of the research categories, your critically ill loved one may get preferred treatment, at least for a while, however the outcome may still be uncertain. If on the other hand your critically ill loved one doesn't fall into a research category, the intensive care team may not be interested in giving your critically ill loved one their fullest attention and they may suggest to withdraw or limit treatment. As I have mentioned in number 9, the way the intensive care team presents your critically ill loved one's case 
may go way beyond your critically ill loved one's diagnosis and prognosis. The way the intensive care team will present your critically ill loved one's case is always heavily dependent on the intensive care team's interests and agenda. Part of that agenda is always research, particularly in big metropolitan teaching hospitals that are affiliated with big universities. Many big intensive care units easily attract millions of dollars per year in research grants and funding. The money needs to be spent on those patients that fall into those research categories. In theory, every patient who is enrolled into a research study needs to give consent or if they are not able to give consent and they often aren't because they are unconscious, the next of kin and or the family needs to give consent. The unfortunate reality, however, and the fact of the matter is that many intensive care units don't tell the families of critically ill patients that they actually are enrolled into a research project where the intensive care team is trialing a new drug or where the intensive care team is withholding blood transfusions because they are trialing the outcomes of a certain disease without giving blood transfusions. The bottom line is that the intensive care team is usually making those decisions right at the beginning of the admission to intensive care when family members are not around. The reality is also that if the intensive care team would ask you and your family or even your critically ill loved one whether you would want to participate in a research study, the answer would most likely be no, and rightly so. Research has its time and place, but not when somebody is battling a critical illness in intensive care. I have seen many questionable research projects where neither the patients nor the families had been informed. More importantly, the intensive care team will use research as a tool or even weapon in the positioning of your critically ill loved one's situation. What do I mean by that? First of all, let's remind ourselves of the millions of dollars of research funding that's going into intensive care units every single year. That's massive and many intensive care units simply couldn't survive without that money. That funding also helps to establish a certain reputation amongst other intensive care units and they like to be seen as research centers and they certainly want to publish research papers where the hospital's name and the doctor's names are published. Sometimes it can be nursing driven research as well. With that in mind, let's just quickly go back to our examples that we talk about, talked about in number nine with your 78 year old mother who had a heart attack that led to a cardiac arrest and to cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Let's just say that your mother's heart attack and the cardiac arrest have been so severe that a survival is unlikely and that any treatment would only unnecessarily prolong the suffering of your critically ill loved one's mother. But the intensive care team is adamant to continue treating your critically ill loved one's mother and they tell you and your family that putting her on an intraortic balloon pump, which is a pump that pumps blood and oxygen to the arteries surrounding the heart, might save your critically ill loved one's life. What they haven't told you is that, that they are currently doing a research study about survival rates after severe cardiac arrests with and without the intraortic balloon pump. The intensive care team therefore has a very high interest in continuing treatment on your critically ill mother. However, in this example, the intensive care team only unnecessarily prolongs treatment and therefore suffering of your mother. On the other hand, if the intensive care team knows that your 78 year old mother has a chance of survival, but also knows that enrolling her in a research study is not an option because she doesn't fall into a research category and if the intensive care team also knows that two other patients can be enrolled into a research study and they therefore need more resources for those two other patients that are already enrolled into this research study, the intensive care team once again might suggest that withdrawal of treatment and or a limitation of treatment would be quote unquote in the best interest 
of your mother. In essence, what I'm saying is that you and your family need to be extremely vigilant. You need to question everything the intensive care team is telling you and not telling you. And you need to quickly get and understand why the intensive care team positions your critically ill loved ones prognosis and diagnosis in a certain light. I really hope that this video has served you well and I really hope that you have gained even more insight of how you can effectively deal with your fears, your frustrations, your struggles, your vulnerability and how you can turn the situation around so that you feel powerful, in control, influential, so that you are mentally well positioned and mentally strong and so that you have peace of mind and that you can deal with adversity. Hopefully I was able to elevate your thinking and also to lift your spirits. I also hope that I will see you in our other videos so that you can find even more strength, more power, more energy, greater influence and peace of mind and also hope in your challenging journey through the intensive care landscape. For more information on a variety of topics within intensive care, check out more of our ebooks, videos, and audios, and also read our blog for more tips and strategies, and look at our Your Questions Answered sections. You can find the links on our website. Thank you so much for watching this video and being part of our video series, and I hope I'll see you again in another video. Thank you.